Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, which is part of Greater Than Solstice Jamboree, a six week festival, um, an online sort of open space event where you can meet lots of people from the Greater Than ecosystem who are offering a variety of sessions, mostly for free to join. So if you haven't checked out the program, take a look. There's still a bunch of other sessions planned going until the end of July. And so today we're here. Um, I'm Francesca Pick. I'm here with my colleague, Alicia Trepat, and we're here to talk about the subject of uh, whether scaling thriving networks is possible or not. And uh, the reason we're bringing this topic is that Alicia and I, we run a course called Thriving Networks. We've run it th three times now. Uh, it's a multi-week course with a bunch of different network leaders, people that are starting new networks um, in the process of maturing theirs. And uh, all of these networks usually have in common that they're somehow working on uh, impact and purpose in some way. But uh, one of the things that we really focus on in that course is all about topics around money, value, resources, uh, how to deal with conflict and tensions and all of these really difficult subjects that can often lead to these kind of groups actually falling apart when they run into them. And one of the persistent questions that comes up in that course is actually uh, how you can scale a healthy network. Because a lot of the things that we do in that course are actually about how to create strong bonds between the group and really mature the relationships and the group's capacity to, to hold these challenging questions. And so naturally, there, there's this question of how do we do that at a bigger scale? So we thought it would be interesting to bring that question in today and to invite, invite a bunch of alumni from our course to actually discuss this question, to dive into it and, and explore it from many sides. And I'm also quite excited that we have uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Rich Bartlett, joining us, who's also going to share from his experience uh, and a lot of great work he's been doing around this question of how to scale or how to, how to basically, uh, yeah, be a great network at a larger scale and has some interesting answers to that question. So uh, before we kick off in also some of our participatory dynamics and some inspiration that we're gonna hear, a uh, quick overview of the session today. So uh, after a brief check-in, we're gonna hear from Rich, who's gonna share with us some inspiration for 15 minutes, some food for thought for the session. After that, there's gonna be uh, 25 minutes of participatory breakouts where you're going to meet some people and get to connect. And after that, we're going to do a fishbowl uh, with the uh, participants of the Thriving Networks course, our alumni, that are going to dive into this question of scaling. And so you'll be able to observe and listen while they talk about their own experiences, what they've learned, what's been challenging. And after that, uh, we're going to have the so-called hazy ending, where also we're going to open up the fishbowl uh, more people will be able to jump in and ask questions and share reflections. So with that, um, this is sort of the introduction to the session. I'm going to kick us off and dive right in. Um, I'm excited to hand over to Rich, who I've known for quite a few years now through the Inspiral Network, because we're both fellow Inspiral members. And I think we probably met for the first time at We Share Fest, but um, Rich is originally from New Zealand, um, now living in Italy. And uh, I would say he came into all of this work through the Occupy movement, where he then uh, learned a lot about how to do decision making in groups and became the co-founder of a really great tool called Lumio that I must say, as someone working in networks for a long time, feels like something that is just an absolute must um, in terms of, yeah, key tools that will help you as a, as a network. And so um, since then, he's the founder of The Hum and uh, offers consultancy guidance facilitation for organizations and networks around organizing without managers. And uh, I can really recommend following him on various channels because he's an excellent writer and speaker. And um, there's a, a lot of really great things to read up and listen up on about Rich. Um, just putting that in the chat. Also a very active Twitter. Um, so yeah, I think with that, I'm going to pass to you, Rich, and yeah, let you kick it off with some food for thought about, I guess, probably micro-solidarity, 
um, which is a concept that I really think is super key when we think about the topic of scaling networks. Over to you. Thanks, Fran. Uh, it's good to be here. I feel like 15% nervous. Not sure why that is. Um, partly I'm looking right at my face now. Is there a way that I can not look at my face or is that just how it's going to be? I think it's very hard, unfortunately, if we okay. want to pin you. I'm sorry. Okay, great. Oh, actually, this I'll take this as a like shadow work practice where I just get to look at myself and beam compassion and acceptance. Hey, Rich. Um, yeah, I am... I think the nerves are maybe a little bit of seeing who's in the room and knowing that there are a bunch of people here with really deep experience. So I don't want to show up as a teacher uh, as if there's people that are completely a blank state looking at this. Um, so I guess what I want to share is my experience, my perspective, the lenses that I use when I'm thinking about networks and communities and groups and, and, and offer them you know, like in the same way I might offer my glasses, like put these on for a minute and see how the world looks. And yeah, see see how this, like, does it make things sharper or does it make things fuzzy? Is it useful to you? And, and put it in your toolkit if it's useful, rather than to say, this is the way things work. Um, I'm gonna do hopefully a reasonably short presentation, a little lightning talk just to get the conversation started. And then we go into breakout groups and you can pull it apart and put it back together and make your own sense of it. Okay, so sharing screen and thanks for the gallery view tips. I have no longer seeing my face. I get to see all your faces instead. Ah, much more relaxing. So I'm gonna talk about this thing called micro solidarity and it says a roadmap for high trust communities. So I know the topic is networks and there are so many different kinds of networks. I wanted to actually focus in on this thing called community because to me, a community is a particular kind of network. And, and like, Francesca mentioned the community that I have the most experience with is this thing called Inspiral. And it's a super high trust. Well, at least my experience of Inspiral has been a super high trust place. So it's like um, a network of between one and 200 people. It fluctuates. It's been around for, I think, 11 or 12 years now. And within that network, I have these relationships of, yeah, really extremely high trust. So like people that I can call up and say, hey, dude, I'm having a hard time. I need 5,000 euros to fix my car because it just exploded uh, and know that I'm going to get that kind of support or I can, um, yeah, that's a very practical thing, but also on the more like emotional or psychological front, like I know that I can get uh, solidarity and care. Someone's going to show up and care about my experience and, and at least provide a listening ear and some companionship, if not some good advice. It's also the place where I get to bring my creative ideas and find other people who are interested and, and receptive to my enthusiasm and potentially even available to, to join on as co-founders when I'm starting out a new project before it's even got any kind of business model or ideas about how the business, the money might work or anything like that. So it's been this amazing uh, location for my growth. I think of it as like, you know, I've got a, a houseplant just there and the houseplant is sitting inside a container and it's like, you need that container for the houseplant to grow. And for me, the, the community of Inspiral has been basically the place where I've done most of my growth and development. So it's 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 this real treasure for me. And the problem is it doesn't scale, okay? Like the, just the way that trust operates, uh, it works because there's less than a couple of hundred people. I, I, I can have meaningful, I can spend time, there's Jorium on the call here. I've had long and deep conversations with Jorium. We've had very ridiculous, hilarious conversations as well as really sad ones. Uh, and I can't do that with 10,000 people. You know, there's just not, it's just the, the social physics of it doesn't work out. And so that's where micro solidarity comes in. It's like, how, how could we support more people to have the experience of being in a very high trust community without all <laughs> inviting them all to join ours? Like, how can we give people a roadmap to build their own? So I'm going to introduce two pieces of theory that I use for thinking about network design, thinking about community design. And these have, yeah, these, I just keep coming back to these. It's sort of, it's almost like it doesn't matter what the challenge is. Like Fran mentioned decision-making, for example. Uh, usually I put on one of these lenses of scale or tempo and I find new insights. So I just keep returning back and back again to it. So I'll start with scale. So Imagine that this uh, this diagram of nested circles just keeps continuing out and out and out indefinitely. 
this I learned this basically from Robin Dunbar, who's an anthropologist, sociologist. People might know Dunbar's number in popular culture. That's this 150 is known as Dunbar's number. And uh, superficially, we treat that as like, that's about the number of people that you can have meaningful relationships with. There's a lot of nuance and, and sort of details behind that. But what I want you to think about instead of Dunbar's number is Dunbar's numbers, that it's plural. And so he he was basically saying, at each of these steps of scale from five people, 15 people, 50 people, on and on and on, that there's a distinct threshold that groups of different size behave like different organisms at these different scales. And the precise numbers are not important. You know, it could be seven, it could be four, maybe it's not 150, maybe it's 180, it doesn't really matter. But this idea that there are these steps, these orders of magnitude that continue 500, 1500, 5000, on and on and on. And if you look at like, Look at how armies are organized around the world or look at how patterns of traditional settlements and in indigenous communities like there's lots of um, uh, source data that says hey it looks like we group people together at these different scales and that those different scales are good for different things so there's things that you can do with five people that you just can't do with 50. like we're going to put you in breakout rooms breakout groups later because you can have a conversation with five people that you can't have with 500 obviously and vice versa versa there's like kinds of economics and um, efficiencies of transactions, efficiencies of scales that you can only do with a lot of people. You can't really have a thriving village with five or 15 people in it, it doesn't work. And this is a very kind of mundane insight, right? Groups of different sizes are good for different things. But I so often find community organizers and network designers kind of using the wrong scale for the job. When I'm working with organizations, sometimes with tens of thousands of people, the, one of the first questions is like, okay, you've, you've got this lovely culture of collaboration and trust and support and so on, but how does it scale? And my answer is always through great teams. Like you can't have a 20,000 person organization that is performing any better than any of its teams, right? Like the, the, the quality of the team relationships, that's where all the work's happening. That's where all of the decisions are being made is down at that team scale. Similarly, if you're organizing a conference, the quality of the relationships between the hosting team of that conference are going to broadcast a kind of emotional tone, you know, like, are they enthusiastic? Are they excited? Are they present? Are they available? Are they anxious? Are they uptight? Are they like kind of making you feel awkward the moment you step in the room? And those are relational qualities, right? It's not about me as an individual person, but me and my co-hosts and the and the the ways that we are relating to each other are going to broadcast it and have a have a real impact on what's happening on the rest of the room. Or another example, when you think about the most significant learning experiences of your life, there's some there's some moments of inspiration where you might be listening to a talk or you know you're watching something on YouTube and there might be a million people who have watched that video and you got some inspiration, but the real transformative learning moments usually happen at the micro scale. They're usually happening with a couple of people in the room where you really get to make a fresh connection or feel some kind of unburdening or like release. That's usually how it goes. And so uh, as you can hear from my bias here, I'm always drawing our attention down to the micro scale and making sure that any kind of network design, any kind of event design, organizational design is really tending to that small scale experience. Because it's at that small scale that you not just have not just the learning, but the, the sense of belonging, the sense of companionship, the sense of trust, all of that's happening at the micro scale. So this is the other lens that I use. Uh, for those musicians in the room, this is a very familiar diagram. If you're not a musician, forgive me if this is confusing to look at, but I'm just trying to show you that there's different tempos, different rhythms that are operating in any kind of organization and any in any kind of group of people. And it's uh maybe a little bit peculiar like a lot of if i asked you to draw your organization usually people draw like people and the connections between people or they draw groups of people you know there's the uh, this department and that department and or there's decision making or a hierarchy or a pyramid there's this kind of like spatial diagram when i draw an organization i start from the tempo that is like what are the periodic encounters that we have what is the what is the time that we come together? And it's like I, I see organizations as this pulsation between we go wide, we we diverge, we explore a million different ideas. There's like all of this autonomy and freedom. And then we converge and we come back and we form agreement and we have some kind of synchronization and getting people on the same page. And then we go out again. And it's this oscillation like this. And the oscillations happen at different frequencies. And 
I know this is a weird thing to say, but I really truly believe that collective identity grows from rhythmic encounters. So if I have a hobby and I do it occasionally, it doesn't form a significant part of my identity. But if I say I'm a footballer and I go to football practice every Tuesday evening and I play a game of football every Saturday, suddenly that becomes part of my identity. I become a footballer. You know, this, this once it becomes rhythmic, once it's like this dependable part of my calendar, it becomes part of my identity. And so that's one of the reasons I'm put, I put such emphasis on rhythmic encounters, like structuring events and opportunities for people to meet to each, meet each other that are not just ad hoc, they're not just this random chaos, but they're these dependable things that I know, ah, yeah, it's Monday afternoon, I do my Monday afternoon stuff. Again, it's like a, it's kind of a mundane insight, I think, but um, really essential to how a group starts to form its own sense of collective identity. I'm going to rapidly just name a few of the rhythms that we use to help you see how this lens applies in, in network design. So there's the relational rhythms, meaning the times that we come together primarily to tend to our relationships. It's not about doing stuff, it's about being together. It's about connecting and, 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 and communicating in that human way. So in a lot of the networks that I work in, we initiate a rhythm of weekly or bi-weekly peer support pods. And the idea with a pod is like, yeah, three, four, five people that you meet with on this, on this rhythm. And you might be doing a like online course together. You might be having um, a more unstructured peer support space where you just get to check in and talk about the challenges in your life and be there for each other. There might be um, different kinds of projects that are happening simultaneously through the network. And it's in these pods that you're like, have your moment of reflection on them. And then at the slower rhythm, we, in, in all of the thriving organizations that I'm uh, working with, we have retreats and usually annual or biannual that we have this opportunity to bring together people physically off this annoying Zoom thing and into, you know, the space where you can have a meal, you can dance, you can rub shoulders together. That, that, that's so essential for cultivating the depth of trust that we're going for. Another category of rhythms we use are planning rhythms. So this is more about objectives, right? This is more about strategy. This is more like how are we getting stuff done? Um, maybe every year we need to stop or every three years we need to stop and really have a big discussion about what's the overall direction, what's happening in the world, what's our position at that strategic level. And once every three months, we have a much more tactical, okay, what's going to be our top objectives. And so like that's where, like I said about the synchronization, that's happening there. This is where we're starting to form a coherent picture of the world. Then there's the working rhythms about actually getting stuff done. And um, some of you will be familiar with that agile management methodology. It's all about breaking big jobs down into small tasks and, and getting those tasks into a little package called a sprint. A lot of the teams I work in, we do two week sprints, but this is like, how can we get this sense of productivity and marking progress every week or every two weeks, every month, it's like we're getting somewhere. And then finally, and potentially most importantly, is the learning rhythm. So this is about, stopping whatever is your main work, your main activity, your main energy, and looking backwards, doing this retrospective gesture and saying, hey, looking back on that last month or whatever is the period here, what did we learn? Like what's, what's going really well that we should celebrate and lift up and say, let's do more of that. And what's not going so well? Where are things strained and tight? And when, when did I feel disengaged? Or when did I feel like we were wasting our time? And pull those lessons out and make sure that you, you can get into a process of continuous improvement. Because if you're doing the relational rhythms where people are developing open communication with each other and you're doing the learning rhythms where people are talking about what's not working and, and finding adjustments that they can make, then you get into the self-improving evolutionary cycle. That's where the, the network starts to kind of steer itself to wherever it needs to be. So to put that all together, uh, uh, the way that I think about like <laughs> how to get started, I know there's some people in the chat saying they're just getting started into this stuff. I always, I always focus on the small group first. So start with a small group. Don't start on your own. I really, um, I really don't want to give you this picture of that scale diagram, meaning you should start with yourself and become a tremendous collaborator and then go on to build a network. No, start with a small group, three, four or five people. And, and start to tune in relationships there that set the tone for what you want this wider network to be. And in my case, the networks I wanna be in are characterized by peer support, meaning 
there's not like a staunch hierarchy of someone who's like giving support to other people, but it's it's mutual. There's this like reciprocal bi-directional support. And when you're getting started, I find it really helpful to articulate a time-limited commitment. So instead of just, hey, I want to do this thing, I don't know what it's going to be or how long it's going to go, would you like to join me indefinitely? Having a time-limited commitment is a lot easier for people to say yes to. And say, for example, if we said we're going to meet six times over six weeks, at the end of that six-week period, you've got a way of saying, no, thank you. This is not really working for me. You know, there's a way to, to close gracefully without losing face. And the lack of this time-limited commitment is, is something that really drains energy out of new initiatives is that you get to this awkward point where it's like, oh, that group doesn't really quite have chemistry, but there's no graceful way to me to, for me to step out. So we just kind of like gradually fade out and then we feel awkward with each other. <laughs> so, so having that kind of bookended commitment really helps make it more graceful and more efficient in this like somewhat awkward process of trying to find the right, the right relationships. Like I said, it's really important to have the retrospective part. So like at the end of that six week period, you stop and you look back and you say, what did we learn? Do we want to keep going? Do we want to recruit more people? Do we want to try different structures, different practices? And once you have one group, one small group humming, then it's time to think about, are there three other groups that we can initiate? And then three more and three more and seven more and 15 more and 50 more, you know, that there's this gradual process starting from real life experience, starting from, we know this is working, we understand what's right for us. We've recruited more people and now they're starting to be some momentum. Then it, then it really does scale. Then it does reach many more thousands of people. So that's about as much as I wanted to share from a theoretical perspective. And um, I have this kind of sense of almost self-consciousness of like, I've just been like downloading. So I'm very curious to hear what happens when we take these ideas and, and translate them into your own context, break them apart, smush them back together. Thank you so much, Rich.